it's a, if it's a fetish, if it has mm -hmm. had sacrificial libations or any kind of stuff poured on it, you don't want to see anything like this. You want to see this kind crusty. of crusty <laughs> or, or, but, um, so the most important thing that Edith, you met Edith? No, but I know about Edith. <laughs> right. Um, the most important thing that Edith said to me about tribal art mm -hmm. when I was asking, like everybody was asking, how can you tell that something is old? She said, Bobby, you have to know how pieces were used. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how it was used, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're, you're just flailing around hoping that the person who sold it to you is being honest. So um, the difference between dealers who sell reproductions and dealers who sell authentic stuff is partially the, the depth of their pockets, but they know what they're looking at. And just like anything else, like playing the guitar or speaking French or anything, it comes with 10,000 hours of practice. Right? That's how you get it. So knowing your stuff is knowing your stuff, and there's no substitute for it. Right. For most collectors who don't know their stuff, after that, you're looking for a reliable dealer, or you're looking for the big auctions, because mm -hmm. You've they've got their reputation. Been. So when you see the stuff that I've bought in the cases at Hamel Gallery, there's always the provenance. There's always which dealer I got it from. That's the proof mm -hmm. in the tribal art world. It isn't actually uh, all, it, all the time. It doesn't work. There, there are fakes around. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. either intentional or not. But the provenance, when it says, bought from James Willis, for example, in mm -hmm. the U.S., or uh, someone well-known. Yes, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says X collection, either the collector. Mm -hmm. uh, when we see uh, Susan Allen, she'll be with Noble Endicott. Mm -hmm. Noble stuff, you know, in a Christie's or a Sotheby's catalog. Mm -hmm. When it says Noble Endicott, you buy the piece, because, <coughs> not because he's a dealer, but because he's a collector who is known for his taste uh -huh. and known for his expertise. So most of us who buy this kind of stuff are depending on the knowledge and honesty right. of the person whose name is attached to it. And then you have a whole class of, of art, Bible and otherwise, where the cost and sort of the, the spirit of the piece is because somebody famous owned it. Mm -hmm. So if it was owned by some movie star, there was a there was a bag of snake that was sold at Sotheby's for a ridiculous amount of money given the piece, but it had been owned by some fun-loving American couple who resembled something out of F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> And there were pictures of the piece being driven around in the back of their convertible. <laughs> the piece itself was normal, but I think it sold for $3 million or something. Mm -hmm. Just because of its personal history. Because of its personal history. Yeah. And whether that's going to make any difference in 150 years, when nobody knows who those people are, that's less, less of 